Good morning, and I'm so glad to see that group. When I came in, they told me I had four people in the room. And I said, for Rembrandt, you know, I'm ready to quit if it goes on. <laughs> but I'm so, so glad to see uh, so many of you there and many online too. So um, this is, of course, a big, big uh, class, as you can imagine, that I actually split in two. So we'll see the, the, the peak of his career in the next class. And then we'll have a special class on the techniques that he uses and the investigation uh, techniques that we have now to recognize and analyze painting. So this is, should be nice. And we'll have also a class on his followers and pupils. Uh, so this is going to be an extended uh, uh, investigation, if you want, of uh, Rembrandt. Rembrandt is, has been such an interesting painter because uh, contrary to most of the painters of his generation and particularly in the Netherlands, uh, he is very multifaceted. Uh, he doesn't uh, restrict himself to just one type of painting, still life or landscape or, or history paintings. He touches everything. And that's what makes him so interesting. So just uh, to have an idea, this is his life until 1642, which is a, a pivotal time for him. He was born in Leiden, and we'll see in a minute where that stands, uh, son of Harman Gerrits van Heijn, who was a miller, and Nelchen Willem's daughter van Zuidbroek, who was uh, the daughter of a, a, mill, a miller. Uh, he was the ninth son out of 10 children, and at the time of his birth, four were still alive. He began his studies under a Latin school, which is really interesting because it would show a kind of uh, ambitious future for him. Uh, not everybody was going to the Latin school. And then in 1620, he was enrolled at the University of Leiden. The University of Leiden was the first university of the Republic of the Netherlands. Uh, they had gained that privilege of starting a university because they had really fought very hardly against the Spaniards. And to, to thank them for what they had done and their sacrifices, they had the choice in paying no tax or getting a university. And they were wise and they decided to go for a university, uh, which became a very, very quickly a famous university uh, with great teachers uh, that are still talked about nowadays. And nowadays it's a huge university, a very uh, successful in the Netherlands. He trained with the local painter Jacob van Zwanenburg, a local master, and then in Amsterdam for six months with Peter Lassman. Came back to Leiden in 1628 and took his first pupils, uh, the most famous being Gerrit Dau that we will see later on. In 1631, he moved to Amsterdam and that was a wise move because this is where was the power, this is where was the money. And for an artist, that's really important is to have proper patron so he can survive. In 1634, he married Saskia van Eulenburg, and we'll talk about that once we see her. And five years later, bought a house on St. Anthony's Breesthaat, which is later uh, called the Joden Breesthaat, which means the street of the, uh, the Jewish uh, people. Unfortunately for him, he is going to uh, getting close between 39 and 42. He's going to lose a whole series of people, including three of his four children, his wife, his mother, and his sister. So this is going to be quite an impact. And it's the time where he gets the most commissions too. So here is his um, general, genealogical, genealogical uh, tree. So you can see 
his mother and his father. You see here a portrait of his mother there and a portrait of his father on the other side. And here we have a whole series of uh, children and Rembrandt is set there. So when you see that uh, suffix on the name like Willem's DR, it means Willem's daughter, the daughter of Willem's. And to shorten that, they just put the D and the dot. For the same for the, the son, it gets its zone and they shorten that with Z and the dot. Mm -hmm. So when you hear that, normally if you had to pronounce it, you have to say Willem's doctor and uh, get it so. Leiden is almost halfway between The Hague and uh, Amsterdam. It's close to the coast and you have it circled here. And when we think about the way the Netherlands was geographically composed. What we see in that map is that earlier way where uh, most of the land in the Netherlands was under the level of water, so the, of the sea. So all you see in blue there was recovered from the sea through a whole series that I explained last time of pumping with windmills that were put in lines, were pumping the water all the way to put it back in the sea. And then they had built a whole series of dams uh, to prevent the water to come back. So for them, when you see a country like this that comes out of there, imagine the pride they had for their country. This wasn't done in, in 10 years, of course. This took a long time. Uh, but this tells you why nowadays with the, the level of the sea that goes up, how they have to protect themselves even more. They have invented some ways to prevent it, these floods uh, that are now copied all over the world, including Venice. So the city of Leiden is a typical city of the time, all walled in to protect yourself against the enemy. They typically are surrounded with moats and where, come, where the water comes from a river, but as they do in, as they have a lot of water, they take advantage of this and make these canals that are so much easier to carry heavy loads much easier to bring them in and then have them go around all the smaller canals within the, the city to download these heavy loads. So very practical way, the Dutch are extremely practical uh, in mind. The arrow here shows the mill that belonged to the mother of Rembrandt. She had inherited that mill that was, um, produce it was giving her quite a, a bit of uh, money and here you can see it on the map it shows the mill that belonged to Rembrandt's family nowadays we still have Rembrandt's parents house the mill that belonged to Rembrandt's family and the old building of Leiden University, which now is of course become, is just a memorabilia. It's an old memory of the beginning of the university. It's now a very modern, uh, the architecture in Holland, in the Netherlands, when they want is extremely cutting edge avant-garde. And so you have all these uh, beautiful buildings that make the university. As far as the teachers are concerned, we set two main teachers, Jakob van Zwanenburg, who was known for his history paintings. History paintings being still considered the most important painting that the painter could do. Uh, it's because it had multiple figures, it required a big composition, it showed the skill that the painter had. So he did with him, but of, of course, you see there absolutely no influence on Rembrandt, who's gonna completely change that style, but he probably there learned 
about how to deal with pigments and how to prepare a canvas or a board uh, or how to do some uh, prints. A much more influential teacher is the one in Amsterdam, Peter Lassmann. Uh, Peter Lassmann that had been uh, in Italy, had seen the, the Baroque painters and the older Renaissance uh, painter had been uh, also a witness of the all the classical art going back to the Roman and the Greeks that were in, in Italy. And there we can see a little more what Rembrandt is gonna see, the chiaroscuro, that light, that contrast of a light and dark. Uh, Peter Lassmann himself is influenced by Caravaggio, whose work he saw, but also by a German painter, um, Adam Elsheimer, uh, who lived in Italy and who was uh, producing some small works, but very pretty works. And this is going to be the first real influence that um, Rembrandt is going to get. We have to talk a little bit about the apprenticeship of a young painter. And this um, engraving is absolutely the best example of what a workshop would have been. So in the very center, you have the master, you have the head of the workshop who is doing a very beautiful historical painting there. Uh, the, uh, he is surrounded by a series of apprentices at different level. And it starts, you can see, with the guy that is over there uh, working on a, carrying a board that he probably had already prepared. Uh, you, the apprentice was really literally starting in dusting the workshop, keeping it clean, and then he would go up in learning on how to grind the pigments and mixing them. And this is what you see here, these apprentices with the grinding stone and they're working. You would get, depending on the kind of uh, pigment you were using, but a lot were minerals, they would buy the rock and then they had to grind it until it was a very thin powder. And then only they could mix it with the, the different media. Once they were good at this, they would learn looking at things. And so you have now two others here who are looking at a bust, classical bust. This is the way they would learn. It's by copying what they had in front of them. And so they're going to do uh, these uh, little sketches and then uh, works, paintings and so on that are just based on these type of subject matter. So they did the need to have somebody sitting for three hours in front of them these busts were very practical. Very important was repetition. And you see that little guy here in the corner who is making, is painting eyes, eyes with different expressions. And so this part of the, the apprenticeship is to make eyes that would look credible, that could be expressive, that could look one side or the other or straight on. And so they would repeat, repeat, show it to the master who would correct them and say, you should do this and that. So this is really part of it. Once they have all that, then they can start painting. And you see here now an older assistant who is there painting uh, the portrait of a lady who is sitting in that chair yeah. together with her uh, lady in waiting. So as you see, it's a progression and to start as an apprentice that you pay it for, the parents of the, the apprentice had to pay for him to be part of the workshop, would take probably for a full uh, learning for a regular painter, would take four years. And then they could present a painting to the guild and be accepted as a master and then they could go on their own. But before they were named masters, they could not get any job. So as you see, this is really a schooling. So uh, the typical timeline, I left the big names on top of court because he's been so influential. Michelangelo, as you can see, died in 1564. Then we have Caravaggio, who is gonna be that main figure of the Baroque period because he introduces uh, on the very in a very successful way, 
uh, that contrast of dark and light, the use of real characters in his paintings. He's not looking at an ideal as most of the painters did in the Renaissance. He's looking at people in the street and he would bring in his studio uh, somebody he met at 10 o'clock at night or maybe midnight that he really liked the face of an old man, an old woman or a young woman or whatever. Uh, this is the way he would pick his uh, models. Now, the other very influential figure for Rembrandt is Rubens. Rubens, who was in Antwerp, not that far from Leiden. Uh, they never met, but Rubens was so, so famous at that time that nobody could ignore them. Uh, he died in 1640. And so uh, Rembrandt had quite a time to know who he was here about people that would sometimes take the risk to go to uh, Antwerp. When I'm saying take the risk, they were at war between the, the Southern Netherlands and the Northern and the Republic of the Netherlands. Uh, these two places were at war. So normally they were not supposed to have direct contact, though Rubens did go up to uh, the Republic during the peace uh, moment, the peace uh, uh, treaty. And, but the way that um, Rembrandt would know of Rubens is because they were paintings that would be sold uh, in uh, auction houses in Amsterdam. And he loved to go to auction houses. So he would see the paintings in real. Also, Rubens had a, a large amount of um, prints that were made of his paintings and that were circulating everywhere. He has, there's almost a rivalry in, in Rembrandt's mind. He wants to do better than Rubens. Uh, we saw last Franz Haas, and there is definitely an, Similar evolution with Rembrandt that with Franz Hartz, who is going to bring his paintings to life. Uh, whereas, for example, in his large portraits, uh, Franz Hartz, that were done until then, instead of having people lined up that would you know, show a militia, for example, that were each paying to be painted and shown part of the militia, he makes them alive, sitting together, having a drink together, conversing. And uh, this is exactly what we will see with Rembrandt too. Peter Lassmann is the, uh, the teacher of uh, um, Rembrandt in Amsterdam. And then Jan Lievens is a contemporary to Rembrandt, a friend of his, by the way, who studied with Lassmann also. And uh, they, it, we will see a few works by Jan Lievens, who is an excellent painter, who in a sense started to uh, improve faster than Rembrandt and then plateaued for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. Whereas we see Rembrandt still making mistakes, you can see in the perspective or in the way he presents the faith. And then suddenly he learns and he learns and he goes up and he goes by Levens and leaving Levens behind. And most people don't even know of Levens, who is, as I mentioned, a very good painter. At the bottom, you see the list of the, the governors. It starts first with the king and emperor Charles V, his son, Philip II of Spain. And then there is that rupture with Spain. And uh, we have William Nassau, who is, becomes the stadtholder uh, in the Netherlands, which is a governor of one province elected by the other governors of the other provinces and becomes the head of the state, if you want. He's, when he's assassinated, he's succeeded by Maurice Nassau and then Frederick Henrik, Hendrik and so on. A figure we have to mention is Constantine Huygens. He is become, going to become a very important person in Rembrandt's life because uh, he is the one who is noticing him as a young painter. Uh, Constantine Huygens is a fascinating figure. 
He was born in The Hague in 96, the second son of Christian Huygens Sr., who was the secretary of the Council of State. And Susanna Hufnagel, niece of the Antwerp painter, Joris Hufnagel, who was a delightful uh, painter, by the way. He learned music together with his brother at the age of five learned art appreciation through his family collection and the exceptional collection of Gaspar Duarte, who was a Portuguese merchant in, um, in uh, The Hague, sorry. Uh, he started his study at Leiden University and was very quickly a multilingual scholar. He, by the end of his life, he spoke eight languages. He started, yeah, he was employed and the fact that he was multilingual was extremely important for him because people could use him to have conversation and translate when uh, there were important people around. So he's going to be employed by Sir Dudley Carlton, who by the way, was a friend of Rubens too, uh, the English envoy at the court in The Hague. And uh, Dudley Carlton is gonna have extensive communication with Rubens uh, for a long period of time. In 1622, he becomes a diplomat in England and he will be knighted by James I. In 1625, he becomes the secretary to Frederick Hendrick of uh, Orange Nassau um, and who is going to become the Stadthalder. In 26, he married Susanna van Bahle and will have five children. Uh, he's appointed to the council and exchequer managing the estate of the Orange family. When you hear the Orange, I want to clarify that. Orange or Orange, uh, properly said in France, is a city in the south of France. When you go to Provence, uh, Orange, the city of Orange is absolutely a beautiful place with a magnificent Roman theater, by the way, still in use nowadays. And that used to be the property of the Orange Nassau family. And so that's why when you see the Dutch celebrating something, they always dress in Orange, in Orange, because of that uh, relationship to, to the name. Orange, the, the city of Orange in France is now part of France and doesn't belong to the family anymore. He was a prolific poet and composer and died at the age of 90, which is incredible age for that time in 1687. He is the one who is, because he's the secretary to Frederick Hendrick, wants to try to find a painter that could be part of, there's not really a core there, but could be attached to the Stadthalder so that he can be used for different purposes. But also it's, it's enhancing the profile of the Stadthalder when he's surrounded by good people. We have to realize that an art was part of that. Of course, the biggest painter of the time was Rubens, but he was working for the enemy. So he couldn't have Rubens. And he started looking at these two young painters, Levens and Rembrandt, and he saw some promises there. And so he's starting to follow them very closely and very quickly he's gonna start providing commissions to them. It's interesting to see that when you see that portrait of Constantin, Constantin Huygens there, he gave the task to Jan Levens, not to Rembrandt. And it tells you how good Levens was at that time compared to Rembrandt. I found this painting really interesting. It's uh, Constantin with all his children. Uh, and that's made by another painter, Adrian Hahnemann. Uh, his very important son, Christian Huygens, is gonna be one of the main scientists in that period in the Netherlands, working with uh, lenses, uh, the microscope and so on, a very, very important figure and an astronomer. So to look at the early paintings by uh, Rembrandt, we see that there is an influence of uh, Alzheimer. Uh, he had the stoning of St. Stephen, we're looking at the work by Alzheimer on the right, shows 
more energy than Alzheimer does, but you have also that sense of the crowd around there. And of course, the story of uh, St. Stephen that comes from the Acts of the, uh, the Apostle uh, shows the, the young man who is accused of uh, speaking blasphemous words against the God of Moses was taken before the Sanhedrin. And his accusers that were incensed at hearing him assert that he saw the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God, expel him from the town and stoned him. And that's what we see here. Uh, the, the Bible goes on and the witness uh, laid down the garments at the feet of a young man called Saul. Uh, so as you can see, he's a young man, doesn't even have a beard. And there they are throwing stones at him. This is an interesting painting and we know that uh, Rembrandt likes to be part of the action. And so this is in between the people that you have his face coming in as a curious witness, looking at what's happening. And this is one of the first self-portrait of uh, Rembrandt. He did another painting that is also influenced by uh, Alzheimer. Uh, Alzheimer on the right painted absolutely lovely flight into Egypt that is important in a sense because it's the first painting that shows correct constellations. So he is aware of the studies that were done uh, at the time. And uh, what you can see here is the Milky Way, which unfortunately we can't even see anymore in Phoenix. Uh, and on the very right, the Ursa Mayor. No, sorry, on the far left. So in, here should be the Ursa Mayor, the, the Grand Ours. By that very big trust of dark and light is a much larger version here of the flight into Egypt by Rembrandt. But we can see that he keeps that one in mind and later on in the 47, he will paint this landscape with the rest uh, on the flight uh, into Egypt that is much closer, much similar to the one of Alzheimer. This is only one of nine painted landscape by Rembrandt and the only one made at night, by the way. He starts to evolve around his twenties and he changes the, the light, the way the light strikes people, as well as the integration of figures. And that's probably one of the most difficult thing for a painter in a composition is to make sure that the one figure relates to the other properly in space. And so uh, we see quite a progress in that Tabit praying for death. Uh, Tabit's bl blindness uh, has condemned him and his wife to a light of grinding poverty. He was pretty rich prior to that. Uh, what was his once expensive tabard is by now torn and tattered. When Anna comes home with a kid that you can see she's carrying there, a reward for her hard work, Tobit thinks she has stolen it. And so in desperation, he prays God to grant him a quick death. Anna looks at him with bewilderment because she knows she did nothing wrong. And so he, uh, this is that very moment that uh, Rembrandt has decided to show in the story of uh, Tobias. Uh, Tobit, sorry, which is uh, Tobias too. Do, we can start looking, this color scheme, for example, is already starting to be implemented by, a, by a Rembrandt who loves these kind of colors, the earth tone. But look at the precision with which he makes the hands and the beard with these very thin uh, brush strokes. But also showing the age of Tobit with the vein and, and the, the hands that are damaged by life. And here's look at the hair of the kid held by Anna. Mm -hmm. 
a small painting. And now when I'm saying a small painting, it's really that. It's the size of a book. It's a little panel that uh, where um, Rembrandt shows probably himself as a young painter. And this little painting has had lots of discussions by scholars that study it in all details and show already what Rembrandt is about. Rembrandt is not about showing beauty, not in the sense that we know classical beauty, beautiful woman, beautiful man, beautiful setting. He's really there to show the reality, the harsh reality. Look at the corner down there where you can see how the plaster is falling apart. Same thing up here. So he's showing something that exists. You have a very humid climate where these type of walls uh, need constant repair. The rest is very humble. He is dressed in an interesting way. It must be kind of cool to have all these uh, layers of uh, garment there. He's got a palette on the wall, some um, urns or some uh, uh, carafes behind. The grinding stone is there behind him. And then he's, we don't see what he's painting, but just by the way he stands back and looking at it must be grand. And it's probably the kind of the hope for that young painter that he's accomplished a grand painting. Very early on, he's going to study himself. And he, he made such an incredible amount of self-portrait. Of course, it cost him nothing to sit. So that's an interesting thing. He had great interest in mirrors all the way to the end of his life. Uh, and so he's looking at himself and he's, it's more like he's scrutinizing who he is when you see that. And you see that evolution of uh, his self-portraits, as you can see, this is uh, just a pen and brush and ink on paper, a small uh, painting, but with, again, that, that harsh contrast of the shade and then the light. But even more obvious here with that self-portrait, uh, that oil painting, where you see him, though interesting, where the fashion at that time was to have hair neatly cut. He loves to show his locks that are falling on his neck. He probably is inspired by an earlier painter that was from Leiden, Lucas van Leiden, who was a wonderful painter, uh, did extraordinary, not only paintings, but extraordinary engraving and woodblock paintings, was very, very known. Uh, unfortunately, he died uh, at the age of 39, so never had a chance to fully uh, explode, if you want, on the market. But Lucas van Leyden, like Rembrandt later, is going to study himself multiple times. And so we have many, many uh, self-portraits of Lucas van Leyden. And here we can see that definitely Rembrandt has seen that self-portrait of Lucas van Leyden. He takes exactly the same pose. He puts a hat on his head and he's looking like him. That's again, a study of himself. Then he starts stepping into more difficult work. Uh, that painting, by the way, has been debated. Um, the one on the, the left, uh, that grisaille, the people uh, attributed him to uh, it to live in, uh, but then they came back for different reason, uh, have decided that after all, it was a Rembrandt. We'll see uh, in that class on the uh, Rembrandt's brush, how every painting that carries the name of Rembrandt has been scrutinized by a committee and has been, some have been uh, reattributed to other painters and some have, that were not considered Rembrandt have been added. So when we say that it's a Rembrandt nowadays, great uh, chance that it really is. So uh, that kind of uh, oil on oak panel, but it's in grisaille, which means it's, it's all in the same, 
color, but just a different shade, uh, shows a surprise. You see uh, Delilah, who is showing the barber who is coming with his scissors not to make any noise because Samson is asleep on her laps. The other one eh, shows an evolution from this painting to done about a year and a half uh, later. Uh, so same thing, but he realized some things were not a happy solution. And so he's kind of streamlining it and comes with that very beautiful composition with that light striking from different places uh, in the background and then on the body of uh, Samson and the face of Delilah. Here are, this is the same painting, just in comparison with the one by Jan Levens of the time. And so you can see how Levens seems to be more self-assured. He's bringing the subject much closer to the uh, surface of the painting. Uh, there is a mix of Rubens uh, in there. There's definitely an influence of Rubens in there too. Uh, but very happy uh, composition here of uh, Jan Levens. Rembrandt is going to go on with small history paintings. This one shows Judas returning the piece of silver, uh, where he's starting to really study the emotions on the, the, the face of uh, the figures that are there. He signs RHL, which means Rembrandt Hermony Leidensis, which means uh, it's, he's Latinized his name. And uh, it means uh, Rembrandt, son of Hermann uh, in Leiden. It shows again the story of Matthew, then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elders. And this is what we see, the coins are on the floor. Uh, Judas is definitely repenting. You can see the expression and the body expression too. Uh, and of course we have the, uh, the priests that are in the background that are astonished by his gesture. But again, we, we have that same color scheme that is so particular to uh, Rembrandt. Another similar size uh, painting shows the presentation to the temple with the introduction of a lovely blue, of course, for the Virgin uh, who is uh, down in the middle. Very fine, uh, very well, uh, paintings, but that don't have yet the impact that what he's going to do later. And then portraits. Uh, he takes advantage of his family because it costs nothing. And uh, uh, here is the beautiful portrait of Rembrandt's mother uh, in 29 made in 29, and then his, to the right, his sister, Lisbeth, who was uh, very close to him. What is interesting is many young painters that don't have a lot of revenues, the painting on the left of the mother uh, through x-rays and other investigation uh, means uh, showed that he had used that panel before to paint an old man. And then he painted over it to make it his uh, mother. Mm -hmm. And he's actually using some of what he had done uh, in the previous painting as, as a background. And then he decides to go to Amsterdam. So Rembrandt goes to Amsterdam. Uh, Amsterdam, that is shown here on the left, 
as early little town, if we can say, in 1538, and shows how uh, it has started, you know, that whole system of canals that Amsterdam is so known for, but it doesn't yet have that uh, great pattern of all the, the gracht that we will see uh, later that I'm going to show you in a minute. But it shows you a busy harbor. Uh, and again, that idea that with the Grand Canal in the middle, you have the river here on the side that uh, goes on the Amstel, from which Amsterdam takes its name. Uh, but then the whole network that allow people to get their heavy loads all transported. And even for people to go from one place to the other, they use the, uh, the barges to go from one place to the other. If you've ever seen The Girl with the Pearl Earring, the movie, uh, it's in Delft, it's the same thing. You can see that how the families move around in the bark, in the, in the barge and uh, not by foot, the streets where typically not very clean uh, because people used to throw, they didn't have a system of, of uh, sewer, a sewer system. So what was to be thrown was thrown by the window. And so it didn't help. And here is now uh, Amsterdam nowadays where you see that whole series of canals that make that belt all around and so each uh, where so you have the single that is one of the largest one the dam square where the the royal palace is now what used to be the town hall uh, the westerker that we'll talk about later on the herrenkart so it's the canal of the, the gentleman the kaiserkart the canal of the emperor the prinzengracht the canal of the princes the leibansgracht how do we translate that? Leiban. Don't remember. And then the single cast. Yeah. So I'm showing here the Bechenhof that we'll see in a minute, which is the Beguinage, where uh, women that were widowed or were living alone would go to be protected. Uh, that was a way to do it. This is where Rembrandt's house is going to be. And then here we have the Portuguese synagogue. And as I mentioned, this, the Amstel River that runs along there too. Just to give you an idea of the context of Amsterdam at the time, here is the Beguinage, the Bechenhof, uh, that is made, that it's a system that existed in Northern uh, Bel what is now Belgium, where, uh, when a woman was widowed and didn't have the protection of her own family, she could come here and she would either share a little house with other people. And they were typically making handiworks. It would be lace, it would be embroidery and other things like this. And so they were living in that place that was closed at night. There was a gate to close so people couldn't come in and they were not in danger. It was not a religious uh, order at all, but they were supposed to go to church every Sunday. It is within uh, the Bechenhof that we have the oldest house, building 1420, the Houten House, the Houten House, so a house made of wood that you can find in Amsterdam. And all the houses that you know Hmm, that's dead. Okay, sorry. You can see the house there on the right that are built. Now, what you look at, you will have different periods because they were built in the 1500, 1600, 1700, all with a different style. But the one thing they have in common is when I, you look at them in profile, they lean forward slightly. And that reason is not that they're badly built, but because on the very top floor, they would have a pulley. And when they were moving, they could bring up the furniture without banging against the facade. And you have here the Magerbrug, which is the, the, the thin bridge, if you want, that is the original bridge 
uh, on, I think it's on the Amstel there, that would raise up when ships were going through. And of course, the of Canaan, which makes it very picturesque, bad in the summer when it's hot because it brings a lot of mosquitoes mm -hmm. and they're big. <laughs> they're very big. There were many churches and still are many churches in Amsterdam. And of course, the one like the other Kirk that used to be the Nicolas Kirk, Kirk is church uh, in Dutch. And uh, the uh, Nicolas Kirk became other Kirk, uh, though the old church, once uh, the countries uh, separated itself from the uh, southern provinces because as you know, they became a Calvinist country. And so what they did is all the church, like the old Arbeke that was a Catholic church was turned into a Calvinist church and ripped of all its decoration because Calvin didn't care for the inner decoration showing uh, figures. And so the uh, stained glass windows were replaced by you, you know, just uh, uh, colored windows, uh, no, no statues, no paintings in there. And uh, so it was uh, retaken by the Calvinists. Now, on the other hand, they started building other churches. And the one that is the Westerkerk that I showed on the map, by the way, is a church that was built in the 17th century to become a Calvinist church. We know also that they were very liberal. Antwerp used to be the most liberal city in, the, in Europe uh, where they would accept all kinds of religion uh, with the majority being Catholic, but then Protestant came in uh, once the, the reform happened in the early 15th century. But all Jews that had been evicted from uh, Spain and Portugal, uh, and you also had Anabaptists and all, all kind of religions until Philip II decided that he wanted uh, Antwerp to become again a Catholic city and pe gave people uh, about two or three years to convert to Catholicism again. Otherwise they had to leave the place. And they saw that at that time, an exodus of half of the population of Antwerp, Antwerp to go to uh, England, the North, to the Netherlands, and to Germany. But uh, a lot of them went to the Netherlands. And so Antwerp was known to have welcomed a large uh, Jewish population, though a lot of them were of Spanish origin, uh, Sp Spain being larger than, than Portugal, they never liked to be called Spanish because the Spaniards were the enemy. And so it became, they became known as Portuguese Jews, mm -hmm. though they were not, but they were also some Portuguese Jews there. So when you see the Portuguese synagogue, it's purely a politically correct name <laughs> because they didn't want to see the Spanish synagogue at that mm -hmm. time. But this one that was though built in 1665 is the proof of the quantity of uh, Jewish population that lived and were welcome in Amsterdam at the time. And it's a beautiful building. You have the painting on the right by Emmanuel de Witte uh, showing the, the very uh, beautiful building with the classical architecture inside uh, and uh, all the uh, elements that made it and were highly populated. It's also one of the only synagogues still nowadays that has sand on the floor, not a hardwood or another, because it's so humid. They didn't want people to bring the humidity from the outside, so the sand was absorbing the humidity if it was. And once in Amsterdam, uh, Rembrandt is going to start getting uh, quite a bit of uh, commissions. Why don't we just take a little break now, five minutes, and uh, we start again. And you can ask me a question in between, stretch your legs. You have coffee and little cookies at the back. Thank you for putting the light, Jerry.
Any questions? Online too, you're allowed to unmute and talk. <laughs> And the camera is stabilized. I'm thinking of the translation of the lane. lane ban. Yeah, I don't know. It's lane. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. A lane. So I don't, uh, and ban is the same thing, is the same. So I don't know exactly what the translation would be. Yeah. Lane ban, yeah, but the tram is not especially good. No, 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 I know. Yeah, I don't know. Hello. Hello. Would, would he be a small person? Not, uh, it, he was definitely not very tall. Yeah, that, but the proportion is a little odd there. And in another one, with him standing as a self-portrait. Oh, I, I, would, I would put him as an average person at the time, which is small now. Yeah. An average person, men at that time would be probably five five or five six something like that he was a rubens was a taller person yes the proportions just yeah but you see uh, he is no he's not but you know the thing is he's he likes to show himself you know some of his self portrait size of a stamp so it, it's uh is it talking about so, um, um, but we, what is amazing is to see how suddenly he takes off and he he really just becomes that more third person he he seemed to have a personality where he's um He's as rather theatrical, and this is what we found in the inventory when he got through bankruptcy. Uh, we have the total inventory of what was sold at that auction, and it's a lot of theater, theater props. He adored theater. Did his career blossom uh, before or after his personal losses? Uh, it, it's just he starts before because he gets the the he gets a commission for the uh, night watch before mm -hmm. Saskia dies, and he's between Saskia sick in bed and him having to work and produce a lot. Oh, wow. hmm. So, are those sketchers? No, no, they're English. Oh. What sort of uh, what sort of theater would uh, would they be um, interested in? At that? You yeah. had what you would call it. It was not an opera or things like that, but they would have uh, plays, either church plays, or they would have uh, the rhetorical the rhetorical society playing these little outdoor theater just like shakespeare you know so they would, would they have would they have been exposed to any, would they have been exposed to any shakespeare or any any of those no uh, because that would be in english yeah and so but they had enough of uh, uh dutch uh plays and so on that they could they, they could play were they more, were they, did they tend to be like religious kind of oh, morality? Could be, plays? Yeah, could, thank you, Francis. Can you turn the little button too so it doesn't? Okay. Well, sorry to lock you out there, <laughs> but we have more. 
And I've got a question. Yes. Um, why did the people sleep upright? Okay, the, it was considered unhealthy to sleep flat because people had often uh, respiratory problems and so they would be propped up by big pillows. So that's when you see the beds are very short because people were almost sitting when they were asleep. Okay, people I'm going to, I have a problem with my list. Okay, so we go on now with that uh, portrait. He's very quickly, once he's in Amsterdam, is it because of his personality or is it thanks to Constantine Huygens and Peter uh, Lassman, he becomes very quickly wealthy. So much so that he can uh, lend a thousand guilders to the art dealer, Erlenborg. Um, he's starting to get commission from rich merchants uh, one of them here, Nicolas Hutz, is one of the first large commission, a portrait commission that he gets. Uh, as you can see, he shows uh, Rutz in a very domineering position. Uh, he shows his wealth, uh, the power and the self-assurance of the man, and his details with great care. It, it's an early period, the, the broad brush that he's going to use later on is not there yet, but it's a, a magnificent portrait because you can really guess the, the personality of, uh, of the man. And then he gets that big uh, commission for the, sorry, I have to, for the uh, anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp. Of course, a very famous uh, painting that is in the Moritzers. If you ever go to The Hague, uh, that's the one to be seen. Uh, he gets that commission through Eulenburg, who uh, he knows, who is that art dealer, and also from uh, a connection he had with a particular um, cast, if you want, of reformed uh, people, the remonstrants that had uh, different different beliefs and different uh, rules, if you want, than the regular Calvinist. He had that connection since uh, Leiden. So he was uh, 39 in the year the anatomy lesson was painted. Uh, what he shows is uh, the Dr. Tulp, who is a man of learning, a surgeon and an anatomist. Uh, for four years, he had been a prelector uh, anatomie at the Guild of Surgeons, which was giving him the unique opportunity of making anatomies. Things were done reg regularly. Anatomy lessons were done maybe once a year because not, you couldn't do that on any kind of corpse. It had to be typically um, a thief or a criminal that had hung. And they, then they would have the permission of using the corpse to do the, an anatomy lesson. Uh, the, uh, Dr. Top was also very famous for treaties on monsters. Uh, he was the first to describe the ileocecal valve that you will demonstrate here on this uh, painting that shows how the, it pulls on the tendon and you have the reaction of the, the fingers uh, straightening up. Mm -hmm. uh, he was then foremost a political animal. He was a city treasurer eight times and four times burgomaster of Amsterdam on top of being a doctor. Uh, so what a top had you on a thing like this, there was a big discussion between the painter and the patron who had to decide how he wanted to be seen. 
he was paying, but so were the other guys that you see around him. They each are paying a part of the painting that was supposed to be hung in one of the anatomical theater around in Amsterdam. So all of the people that are in the painting were wealthy middle-class citizens, not especially part of the Surgeon's Guild. And then some of the observers were physicians. The university in Amsterdam only opens in 32, so it means that it's a very new university at that time. The demonstration shows a kind of a sympathy between the body and the soul, limits between the clay and the spark of divinity. And uh, the opportunity came uh, for that thing when in the winter months, a man, we know his name, and I'm trying to see where it is. Yeah, the, his name was Achis Kind, had been hanged for armed robbery. Immediately after the execution, his body was taken to the anatomy the theater of the Guild of Surgeons, and the anatomy would take place. Now, the preparation of the corpse for the anatomy was not done by the surgeon. He had assistants that would take care of all the dirty work. And he would just very delicately show the tendon and show the things like this. Very strong chiaroscuro. You can see how the spotlight effect on, on the faces and on part of the corpse uh, is there. Here's the name, so you can read it, the ileocecal valve. The signature that about that time, because the, the signature of Rembrandt is going to evolve with the time, is this one, uh, a much more clear signature in showing the, this is not on another painting. But so if you look at it, what is, oh gosh, I'm sorry. This is the R. <laughs> <laughs> so he states himself there, even in the, the middle of the, the corpse. And here is what he's trying to demonstrate. How that when he pulls that up, you have the, the, that uh, straightening of the fingers. And when you let it go, it relaxes and then he can... These anatomical lessons uh, were painted every year, these groups, this is another, that would have been a typical anatomical lesson, uh, anatomy lesson uh, here of Dr. Johannes van Burton, and that's in Antwerp, where anatomy lessons were done for a much longer time. Now, Beside the fact that each of these faces are a portrait and one of them has been added at the last minute, obviously he must not have been available when he was doing, so this face there was added a little later on. <laughs> but this is not the only correction that happened on the painting. I had the luck when I was in The Hague many, many years ago to go and visit the, um, restoration lab in uh, The Hague. And at the very time, they were working on the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp. So not only did I have the painting just, you know, just straight, but across from it, one of the investigation tools that uh, exist at the time is x-rays. And this is a picture I took myself of that because nobody else has that if you want on, on the thing where you can see how they took a whole series of x-rays and then they put them side by side mm -hmm. to show the, uh, the painting and be able to see uh, the way uh, Rembrandt proceeded in painting this and to see if there are some pentimenti. A painter, when he composes a painting for the first time, is going to correct things sometimes that he doesn't like as much. And this is visible in these tools of investigation. Now, they came with a surprise when they did this, 
Because if you really observe well what happens, do you see what I see? He had, his hand had been cut. There's no hand there. So probably prior to being hanged, he had, they had cut his hand as a punishment to be for him being a thief. And probably because it was kind of a gruesome image, Rembrandt was asked later on to add the hand. So this is what you discover when you do these things. So then you do the dean of the court and then individual portraits of the different people to add to the painting. They weren't all there standing. The he would know, he would, this, he probably had a sketch when they were there very quickly. Yeah. And then he would do separate portraits yeah. With the head more or less in the position he wants individually. The anatomy theaters, as I say, were really important. This is more or less the way it would have looked. So you had this around uh, theater, and so people would come, physicians or not, but it was a curiosity factor. For a while, they thought that it was the um, still existing anatomy theater in the Waag. The Waag, uh, which is a former gate of Amsterdam, but was used as a way place where people, when they were importing things, they had to go there and weigh the, the, the place so they could be stamped and make sure that how much they brought in was what had been sent from far away. Or when they were exporting things, they had to weigh, so they had the stamp to certify the weight of the things. Uh, you, when you go, and I think it's still the same because I did that many, many years ago, it's now a little cafe, kind of a, a place where you can have a refreshment. But then you go and you give a little piece of money to the bartender, and he it lets you go through a little door. And when you go through that little door, you end up in what still is an anatomy theater in, the, in one of the towers. But that was only built in 1991, so long after Rembrandt died. But this is still something you can see and they have conferences from time to time. They, and on the ceiling that you see on the right there are all the coat of arms of the different great physician that were there. Rembrandt, as I say, was kind of aware of his value and he loved to fantasize about it. I think he wanted to be more than he was as a person. Loved theater because that could, that was adapted to, to his fantasy of the world, if you want. So here is a self portrait wearing a top and a gold chain. And in particular, these gold chains were typically given to people, painters, and others when they were meeting kings or princes, they then would give it to them as a recognition of their regard for the person. So old painters, though the great painters would have had one from the King of England or the King of France or whatever, and would have that. Rembrandt had received none of them, but he was able to buy in auctions where you know, it was part of things that were sold. And the interesting thing is, as you can see, he displays it beautifully, you know, like saying, you see what I have. Compare that with the self-portrait by Rubens that you see there, who apparently had so many of these chains because he was adored by every single sovereign in Europe that he was displaying that he had the rotunda with all his artwork and he had his chains there. And look that all you can see of the chain is that little thing there to show you that Rubens was a more modest person than Marembrandt was. <laughs> and then he meets Saskia. Saskia, 
uh, he meets her in 1633. She is the cousin of the Ardeel Erlenborg that you already heard before. And so in, she's visiting her, her uh, cousin in Amsterdam. She lives in Northern uh, Netherlands. And they like one another, but she's also worse, 40,000 Florin. Mm -hmm. Uh, Florence. She can read, she can write, she's educated, she's fearless, but she's wealthy too. She lost her mother at age seven and her father at age 12 and was brought up by an older sister. So uh, she waited and studied, you know, uh, what she was, of course, with her uh, cousin who was an art dealer. She was a raw artist. And so when she meets Rembrandt, uh, they kind of like one another. And um, she, uh, they decide to get engaged. And here you see in 33, that first portrait of Saskia Prohat, which I think is absolutely delightful uh, portrait of her. She was born in Leeuwarden and she was the youngest of eight children. So they married in on June 22nd, 1634. Uh, in had built, so he went north to to uh, to marry her. His own mother uh, and father didn't attend the the wedding. She the mother gave her um, agreement by a cross on the contract to say that she was uh, she was. And it looks like what we've seen with him, he applies to Saskia. So very quickly she becomes his model and she's, he dresses her with these exotic costumes and flowers. Uh, and they definitely are very uh, much in love, uh, the two, they, they have uh, a same pleasure of, of life, if you want. So here you have that green silk. All these are props that he buys. They, apparently his house was full of clothing and beautiful fabrics that he would use in his uh, paintings. She's shown here as the goddess of flowers in spring, which is of course associated with love. Then comes this uh, painting, which is uh, Belshazzar's feast that relates to something that you hear quite often in regular life. It's the writing on the wall. And I'm sure you use that phrase from time to time. I heard, I, I was listening to somebody on television who was, that was the writing on the wall. Uh, this is a, a, an idea of, of doom actually and misfortune. And it originates in the biblical book of Daniel where supernatural writings foretells the demise of the Babylonian empire. What you see here is Belshazzar, who is the king of Babylon, that gives a great feast uh, at which wine was drunk in the golden and silver vessels looted by his father, Nebuchadnezzar, and I can never pronounce it, Nebuchadnezzar from the temple in Jerusalem. And of course, this is sacrilege. You're not supposed, to, not only did they loot it, but on top of that, they, they are the sick, you know, removing all the sacred side of it. And so it's gods of gold and silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone, which see not, not hear, nor know, were praised while God himself was not glorified. And there came four fingers of a man's hand and wrote in the palm, the plaster of the wall. And it's written in the Aramaic, and it's mene, mene, tekel, uparsim. When they see that, they can't read what it means. And they have to call Daniel, who is a Jewish uh, seer that was able to read the supernatural inscription, which means, in fact, uh, he, he reads it 
Mene is a mina, Tek is shekel, and Peres, which is Ufarsim in singular form, is half a mina, and he, in, he can interpret the thing, saying it means numbered, number, weight, divide. And his interpretation is that by many, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have weighed on the scales and found wanting. And then Uparsim, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persian. And the very same night, Belshazzar is died die, and his kingdom is gonna be split between the two. So this is what you have in front of you. Uh, the uh, Mene, Mene, Tekel is Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Uparsim is in two columns. So whenever somebody tells you the writing is on the wall, tell them, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Uparsim. <laughs> and they won't know what you say. <laughs> Here you have it. Another interesting painting, and this is, of course, we, we're starting to see his genius in just the, the expectation of, of, you know, the painting, that look of the, the man to, to the wall. Another quite interesting and very different painting is uh, Ganymede being take, uh, carried off by Jupiter, being the eagle, of course, the symbol of... Now, in Greek mythology, Ganymede is a divine hero whose homeland was Troad, which is Troy. He was a prince. He was the most handsome among mortals. And this is the reason why Jupiter abducts him. So he becomes the cupbearer of Jupiter in, uh, in Olympia. Now, this has in normal Renaissance painting a very homo, homo erotic uh, meaning, which means uh, it was the kind of, it becomes that kind of a um, homosexual relationship between the old Jupiter and the young beautiful man. And this is what mythology is all about, this kind of excusing the, the weaknesses of human beings by putting them in action with the gods also. So let us say the gods do it so we can do it. In the Netherlands, which was a very Puritan Calvinist, this is not at all the meaning that they have when they told about Ganymede. As you can see, he's a young child. He's not that beautiful adolescent. And what it came to be is in fact the taken by death, early taken by death, happening when a young child is as early is taken to heaven early. This is what the image becomes in the Netherlands. Now, this would be the typical painting and you see the Correggio where you see in fact that young beautiful adolescent that is taken up north, up, up in the heaven, not north. Here is the drawing of the preparation drawing for a Rembrandt's work. And what you can see as a, a difference between this and this, here not only he's showing the eagle taking the sleeve up and then with his talon holding the, the, the arm, but he is so frightened that he defecates. <laughs> he corrects that in the painting by giving him water. Not defecation. <laughs> and it's it's just absolutely adorable because I'm I'm thinking every time I see that my grandson was baptized in the Greek Orthodox Church, and when he was put in the water, this is what happened. <laughs> we still tease him every time we talk about it. So here it is, you know, see a very frightened baby that in fact is representing a child, the portrait of a child taking too early. Uh, this would be another version by another painter, contemporary Nicolas, 
that shows here the, de the depiction of uh, Ganymede that uh, is just uh, a deathbed portrait of a child. More entertaining, I would say. The only painting we have of uh, showing both Saskia and Rembrandt is this one. And this one still shows some difficulties by integrating the, the figures. It's of course a self-portrait of uh, Rembrandt. And then his wife is sitting on his laps, but the distance is not correct. Her head is turning, she's like an owl. Yeah. There's no way she could have that. But it shows the fact that they seem to share the joy of life. That's a young couple, they, they're independent, he's successful. It also could represent the prodigal son. And that's something we find a lot in the Netherlands and we'll find that in other countries, but particularly there, a moralistic painting showing the prodigal son spending his money with prostitutes. And that was very, very often shown. So it could be that this is what he wanted to, to show. Here is another that shows here the self-portrait with Saskia. Uh, also interesting, he's showing his hand at rest. He is right-handed and it wasn't well seen to be left-handed. It was the left being evil. I'm an evil person, I'm left-handed. But so he is just leaving the hand at rest, not uh, really in action. He gets more and more commission, as you know, because of the Calvinist church, the churches themselves don't offer commissions. In the South, in Catholic countries, the church contributed to over half of the commissions for painters. So in the North, they have to find other patrons. And you find some religious paintings uh, just for devotion. So they would be smaller and they would hang, you know, in, in the house. Uh, and this is a beautiful uh, painting showing the descent from the cross. And I really want to contrast it because it is in depth to Rubens, but you can see immediately the difference. This is the very famous descent from the cross, the, 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 on the leave of Hauerkerk in Antwerp, uh, just an extraordinary early work by Rubens. But what you see there is two different philosophy. And it's very much the reflection of the contrast between Calvinist beliefs and Catholic beliefs. Rubens, when he shows Christ, he shows a Christ that is dead, but he's triumphant. By his death, he has redeemed us from our sins, but he's triumphant. Very different with uh, Rembrandt that shows a very limp body, much more as it would be in reality, that shows a body that, body that has suffered. And the focus is on the, the, the suffering of the passion. Otherwise, as we can see, we have the light I suspect that this one needs to be cleaned and hasn't been for a while. So uh, the, it has that cast of yellow that is too much, that emphasizes that uh, the other one has been taken care of recently and is in, shows the bright palette of Rubens. He, again, is going on with the, the, the story of Samson and Delilah. Uh, in a very brutal way. Uh, it's, he is looking at the painting by Rubens and this is just a sketch, I couldn't get the, the final painting, but it, it's an extremely violent scene. If you compare it to what was before where it was before Samson was blind. Uh, in this case, it's exactly when it happens you see the sword of the soldier in the eye of Samson. You see the other one saying, don't move because otherwise you have another sword. He's held on by two men. And then you have uh, Delilah leaving with the hair of Samson. She has done what she was supposed to do. <laughs> and this is very much what um, 
Rembrandt is, is starting to do is being at the, the top of the action, which is typical of Baroque painting. That's what Caravaggio was doing too. Some mythological painting, only one, this is delightful. It's debated for exactly what it is. Not everybody believes that it is Danae. Uh, some people uh, believe that uh, it's Rachel awaiting Jacob, Venus awaiting Mars, Hagar awaiting Abraham, Leah awaiting Jacob, and so on, because there is no golden shower. And the golden shower would show what Zeus is doing to try to impregnate Danae. So no golden shower, but there is the servant, and she's opening the curtain for the arrival of somebody but we don't know who it is. And as uh, he didn't give a title to it, we, or we lost it, we don't know exactly what it, most people believe it's the Danae. And the self-portrait show really who is becoming. He's become a very self-assured person. He is that marvelous uh, Rembrandt leaning on the stone still where he has that typical manly approach where he puts his elbow in your face. And that was a way for men to show their manhood. And so he's there and looking at you very self-assured. You have to the right a series of dates with the different uh, signature that he did. And there is no doubt he had just seen a painting by Raphael. And that's what he's inspired by. And uh, just as he did early on with Lucas van Leiden, he's doing it now with Raphael. And he says, I'm as good as Raphael, you know? So there is my, my elbow. And you can see the little sketch he does when he sees the painting. I see myself there very well. In 16, sorry, uh, in 1639, he and Saskia moved to a very prominent and big house. That's the one in between here, if you've not been to Amsterdam. This is Rembrandt's house. It still is known as Rembrandt's house and Rembrandt's museum nowadays. Why, why I showed you all this is because Erlenburg, the, the art dealer, used to have that house. This one has been rebuilt in the 19th century. But there was the house of Eilenburg. So there they get the house next to the cousin of Saskia. Mm -hmm. Big house, expensive house. People blame him saying he's spending Saskia's dowry by buying it, but he's doing well uh, money-wise. He gets lots of commission. Here is the reconstruction of his studio where you can see lots of props. They went through the, um, the inventory of the auction house and tried to reconstruct what he had. And they also had an outside studio for the very large works that were then protected. And unfortunately, this is when he becomes the most known, the most famous, he gets the biggest commission is actually by that time, uh, in, 19, in 1640, he gets the commission for the night watch that he has to prepare because you have to get all the people and so on. And that's when everything happens. His mother that you see here in 1631 is going to die in 1638. And she's the first one that dies. His little son, Hambuk, uh, Hamb Humbertus is going to die. Two of his daughters, two, his two daughters that are just about nine months apart, you know, they just came like this, both die at barely born a month old. Oh. The only child that he's going to keep is Titus. And here we'll see later portrait, we'll talk about him again. But these two delightful uh, paintings of his son, the only child that he is going to keep. And unfortunately, he's going to die before him. 
but here is the portrait of a boy that is presumed to be Titus and it's great chance and Titus at his desk. Absolutely delightful portrait. And Saskia is sketching um, probably we believe tuberculosis. Uh, you can see here a reconstruction of the living room where typically was the bed too. The, the, the bed was often because it had to be close to the fireplace. And as um, Jan mentioned online, uh, the beds were very short because people were propped up with lots of pillows behind them. They never slept flat on their back. It was considered an unhealthy. So the short beds, and you can see he made multiple a sketch of Saskia in bed sick. And this would tell you that he was really torn between his work and then what was happening to Saskia uh, in that time. Here is a sheet of different sketches, but you know, paper was not cheap at that time. And so he takes advantage of that one sheet and we have uh, one, portrait here of Saskia and then the other one up there that was at an angle. And so unfortunately, at age 30, Saskia dies on the 14th of June, 19, uh, 1641. And here is her uh, tomb in the Outer Kirk, still there. And unfortunately for him, this is a really difficult time because he sees success. Uh, and that's what we'll see in the next class uh, with his successes and then the debacle because he cannot count. He loves to spend, but he cannot count. <laughs>